Um, so welcome back, and uh, we look forward to this afternoon. The main item uh, that we're going to kick off with is learning about each other's groups, the proposals that have come in. Um, linking it to lunch, this is really a bit like the, uh, the sort of the menu, the smorgasbord of goodies that we have to share between ourselves in terms of what each group has to offer. And so we are taking the opportunity to learn uh, who's doing what, uh, what particular uh, things they're focusing on, what they're hoping to achieve. And um, we've asked each group to put together a short presentation. So for the, the so-called nascent networks that we'll be presenting first, there are seven of those. Uh, we've asked, offered sort of 10 minutes to look at these three questions. And then the teams... Uh, that we'll be following later on this afternoon. We'll do the same, but in a slightly shorter time, five minutes each. So hopefully that's clear. This is your opportunity to learn. If you have all, I see many of you are rifling through them, but the one-pagers, those would be good to have. Um, the way we've designed it is that obviously the one-pagers inform a certain amount about what each group is doing. The presentations are meant to take it a little bit further with these three questions in particular, the groups that are part of the leadership the problem uh, looking to solve, and the big challenges. So the presentations take it on a bit. Uh, we des deliberately designed it, and I know I was asked this at, at lunchtime again, we del deliberately designed it not to go into Q&A with all the groups. As you can imagine, we're already going to be spending about the next two and a bit hours, or part of the next few hours, two hours of which we'll be hearing from groups. So we could go on for a lot longer than that if we have some Q&A. So what I really encourage you to do is to listen uh, intently, obviously, and write down on your one pages or some other bit of paper those groups that you're particularly interested in following up with. And then when we conclude our time together this afternoon at 4.30, then will be the opportunity really to get together, uh, go and ask those people that you have questions of, go and find them, get them before they disappear back to their rooms or head off to the reception. Yeah, so that, that'll be the first time later, as well as over the break. So I really encourage you, mark down those people you want to get and then go and get them as soon as we're done. Great. These are the seven uh, nascent networks that are going to come up and, and talk. And I'm, all my role is twofold. I'll just say hello and welcome them up, uh, naming the network and who's going to be coming up. But then it's over to you. And as I say, the networks, you've got 10 minutes. I will be sitting there listening, enjoying what you're saying. Once you get to eight minutes, I will stand up. <laughs> and that will, that, that's what I'll do. And then as we get to nine and a half minutes, I'll start making other indications that your time is running out. So I hope you're all confident that 10 minutes is enough to get your messages across. But as I say, I'll uh, sort of keep an eye on you, enjoy it, and then at eight minutes I'll stand up to let you know there's two minutes left. Great. So I hope everyone enjoy this afternoon in terms of what we are going to learn and share from our colleagues. And as I say, write down those people that you really want to connect with once we're finished. So I'm going to kick us off, and uh, Peter Satmari is going to come up and talk about the Canadian Youth in Transition Network. So. Peter, over to you. Oh, one final thing before Peter starts. All your slides are loaded consecutively on the machine here. So all you need to do when we reach the end of each talk for those coming up, you just press the down arrow and it will take you onto your slides. You don't need to do anything else. They're all loaded one after the other. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so hi, everybody. Uh, Peter Zotmari from, I have to get the name right now, CAMH Sick Kids uh, and the University of uh, Toronto. Hi, friends. Hi, potential partners. First slide. What kind of groups is our uh, uh, network, uh, part of our network leadership? So uh, we were really, we started working on this about, uh, last uh, November, and really very quickly were able to uh, organize a large group of folk from a variety of different uh, disciplines, walks of life, uh, uh, places that they've worked. So we've got clinicians and researchers, uh, executive directors of a variety of different agencies. One of the themes of our, we have sort of two major foci. One is to do away with diagnostic boundaries. So we're bringing together executive directors of uh, mental health agencies, agencies for developmentally disabled, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder groups, and addictions. Uh, we've got a, a large group of parents uh, with, uh, of kids that have uh, mental health conditions. Uh, developmental disabilities, neurodevelopmental disorders, and addictions, uh, youth themselves with these particular challenges, policymakers from several provinces, 
uh, advocacy groups from across the, the country. We've really tried to make it uh, multidisciplinary, multi-professional, uh, non-academic, uh, non-Ontario, non-Toronto uh, centric. So we've really worked hard at getting representation from across the country, from the Atlantic provinces uh, to British Columbia. So what is the uh, problem that we're trying to uh, solve and what unique is unique and transformational uh, about our uh, solution? So uh, in a sentence, our focus is on the transition of youth with uh, mental disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders and addictions from adolescence into uh, young adulthood and we're focusing on the 14 to 24 year age range primarily because for a five year period you we need to be able to have that transition into the adult adulthood it's not the adult care system it is into adulthood so you're able those youth are able to meet the challenge the developmental challenges of adulthood and uh, an important uh, point about uh, our group is that we're working across diagnostic silos because we think that's a, an enormous barrier in access to services. So there's so much comorbidity between these conditions. And by neurodevelopmental disorders, by the way, we take a very broad view of that. That includes attention deficit disorder, autism spectrum disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, psychosis, early psychosis, we consider a neurodevelopmental disorder, uh, intellectual disability. So a very broad definition of what neurodevelopmental disorders are. Uh, and I think everybody here recognizes the comorbidity between these conditions. Uh, also, we want to do away with uh, silos, that uh, service silos, uh, that are based on diagnostic and age restrictions. I mean, these are uh, ubiquitous throughout the system. I think everybody knows uh, what a uh, barrier there are to uh, those are to accessing services. And the idea behind our project is that we want to develop local, what we call evidence to practice portals spread out across the country whereby demonstration projects are able to implement programs and then evaluate them uh, that focus on collaborative care models that facilitate the transition of youth into adulthood. So how will our idea d uh, identify youth who need service and treatment? So each uh, evidence to practice portal will develop partnerships, collaborative care models with schools, primary care, justice, um, welfare agencies, places where kids are not currently receiving treatment and then facilitate their transition into a treatment service and then carry them in a collaborative fashion into uh, adulthood so that they're able to meet those developmental uh, challenges. Uh, one way that we're going to make sure that more kids are receiving uh, services and access services is that we're going to uh, involve partners from across different silos, from mental health agencies, both child and adult, uh, child welfare, schools, all the different agencies in a local area that are working with kids. We're going to get them together, including youth and including parents, with these evidence to practice portals and help them develop a, uh, a, um, a collaborative care model that works in their particular region and uh, locale. And a really crucial uh, bit is that we know from the research literature is that an enormous proportion of youth uh, get lost in the transition from the child and adolescent mental health system in the adult system. And to ensure that they don't get lost or fall through the cracks or whatever, that we're going to break down those age barriers whereby we're able to follow those kids and, and carry them along and allow them to have a sort of a soft landing uh, in an adult sector that will be able to care for their mental health uh, neurodevelopmental disorder and addiction needs. So it's breaking down those diagnostic barriers, breaking down those age barriers uh, that we uh, propose to make sure that more kids uh, access services. And to make sure that kids get better care, this is the knowledge generation, the science part of our proposal. We propose to develop different types of evidence to promote uh, these evidence portals, systematic reviews of the literature, really important that we know what actually has been done, uh, 
We propose to do clinical trials, including randomized control trials. Qualitative research will be an important part so that we can capture the experiences of youth uh, and families as they're transitioning through the system. These different types of evidence will then be used to make sure that we're aware of the best available pathways to care for uh, these, vulnerable, uh, these vulnerable youth. And we also want to make sure that the care that they receive is developmentally sensitive and not driven by their chronological age, because uh, often there's a, uh, the services ignore uh, the developmental needs of uh, individuals at different parts in their development. So uh, the biggest challenges that, uh, that we face, well, clearly we want to uh, make sure that we incorporate youth who uh, are at risk of developing chronic and complex conditions uh, into our proposals. So we want to make sure that, that youth who are on the trajectory to having a, com uh, a complex and chronic uh, mental health condition, neurodevelopmental disorder, or addiction, that we're able to identify them and include them in the pathways to better care. Not only do we want to focus on the transition from youth into adulthood, but we also want to focus on the transition into care uh, for those who are currently not receiving care. And accessing that particular population is going to be a challenge for us, and we'd like some help and support around uh, some ideas. And we don't want to get too diffuse. Um, I think the challenge for us is that there's so many different things that we could possibly do. We don't want to dilute uh, the quality of the product that will come out at the end. We need to engage more service providers who are working with youth in transition uh, and youth and their families into these uh, evidence to practice portals. So developing these local um, grassroots uh, um, little communities of practice that can focus on this particular problem is I think going to take some work at each of the different sites uh, uh, across the country. And then, of course, challenging the institutional barriers that restrict access to services to specific diagnostic categories or age groups is an absolutely infuriating um, uh, thing uh, that I think uh, we really have to challenge uh, as much as we possibly can. But institutional barriers are strong, uh, and it's uh, going to take... Uh, 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 a lot of evidence and energy to uh, challenge those uh, category to those institutional barriers, and I think there is a systematic failure in the field uh, to recognize that in adolescence these uh, diagnostic boundaries that we have uh, are fuzzy and they lack long-term validity. They may lack they may have short-term validity, but they lack long-term validity, and yet still people organize services. Uh, around diagnostic categories, which we think is a mistake and needs to be challenged, and uh, needs to be challenged at a at a systematic level all across the country. So that's the end of uh, my presentation. Wonderful, thank you, Peter. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Peter, for setting our example, um, getting us going. I'm now going to welcome the Canadian Youth Mental Health Implementation Network, uh, represented by Stan Kutcher, Catherine Berkeson, Kelly Anderson, Don Glover, and Ian Mannion. So, well, welcome. Great, thank you very much. We're actually going to role model how we do things, and we're going to have five people present in 10 minutes, which is a challenge in and of itself. If you look at the whole exercise that we're trying to do, and I think Justin talked about this, change happens through evolution or revolution. Evolution is much too slow. Revolution can be dangerous, and people can get hurt. So perhaps when we're looking at TRAM is provoked evolution. So how do we accelerate the change? How do we do more with what we already know? And that's an exercise in implementation science, which we are all about. Um, we are looking at what we already know in terms of the most common problems uh, facing youth in terms of their mental health. Uh, and we're looking at the front end of care, the most common problems, but also early in the care pathways in terms of the involvement in schools uh, uh, and primary care, in terms of identification, but also the first instance of care, and then the streaming in the pathway to more specialized care as, as necessary. Um, the change that we're proposing is grounded in evidence, but it's rooted in practice and policy, but it's also filtered through the, filtered through the lens of young people and families, and you'll hear in just a moment how critical that is. In terms of the partnerships, everybody you could possibly think of that's already been listed, I think, on Peter's list. Uh, but a couple of very important distinctions. 
Uh, we are actively engaging communities. We have 15 communities that have already indicated that they have some capacity, they have change readiness to look at the best in class uh, approaches to intervention that exists that we can be putting together and implementing across sectors in a horizontal uh, uh, integration of services and implementation of those services. We also have a body of international advisors uh, that have experience and guiding us in this activity. But the most important partnerships that we have are the young people and the families that are helping us get it right. So I'm going to pass it on to Catherine. Hi, my name is Catherine Berkison, and I have the absolute pleasure to work at YouthNet Réseau Ado. So for those of you who aren't too familiar with YouthNet, it is a bilingual for youth, by youth, mental health promotion, education, prevention, and intervention program run out of the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa. YouthNet is the longest, strongest, and most successful national youth engagement organization. The youth voice is paramount in everything that we do at YouthNet. So being a for youth, by youth mental health promotion program, youth are involved in everything that we do from program development to advocacy and education, as well as hiring of staff. Because if staff that we're hiring aren't being engaged and if the youth aren't feeling connected with them, then they really won't be connected with young people out in the community. So we've already engaged numerous young people and parents in our network and I'd be more than happy to share some of those points with you later. But I do have, however just want to leave you with one little statement made by one of our youth regarding what we're trying to do here today. The day that you can receive care as quickly and nonchalantly as a cold or mono is the day that we have succeeded in improving the mental health system. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kelly Anderson. Um, first and foremost, I'm a parent. I have two um, adolescents with mental health challenges. And because of those, I went on to form two organizations in this country that are by families for families. One is provincial and one is national now. And what's really important, I think, is um, the F word. And I think we need to switch up what we traditionally know is the F-bomb, and I think we need to start thinking about it as families. Um, I haven't heard it a lot here yet today. Um, we, we're all here because of uh, youth, youth and adolescent mental health. But I can tell you for thousands of families and people that I've connected with in 14 years, many adolescents wouldn't make it without their families. And I think that any transformation that takes place, families have to be considered as part of that transformation. And that's the piece that I'm respecting and appreciating so much about this proposal, is I've heard that that's important. And it's certainly a piece that I, I know that our team and another team that I'm on, and probably most of you, are interested in, because that is actually what will create the transformation that we're talking about. So thank you very much for being here. Could you explain the visual? Just yes, sorry. This is one example of what we did when we brought together um, young people, families, researchers, and service providers for a full day in British Columbia, and we talked about research. And some of those, most of those people in that room uh, had not actually sat together in that way to talk about research and talk about uh, what matters to them in research. Because often we felt research just gets developed in a vacuum and you don't ask the people that we're researching about what they'd actually liked researched. So we did a whole day with them and came up with a report. And it really spoke to the magic of bringing young people with adults and systems people and their families together. It really was an example of collaboration in its truest sense. So thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Don Glover with the Department of Education in uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, what I really enjoy about being here today and being part of this team is that we're redefining the school community. Uh, this is my 40th year in public education as either a teacher or an educational administrator, and the school community has evolved. I, I took something from Justin's comments this morning that we're here and we have to be recognized, and we have to recognize that what we thought of as education years ago is not what education is now and will become. And this proposal, uh, for me, is exciting in that it speaks to collaborative partnerships. Uh, we have a history in Nova Scotia. We've worked very closely 
uh, with Dr. Kucher. He's a well-known name in education uh, in our schools. Actually, it's, it's successful when he's known to parents, to teachers, and to educational administrators. So we're excited to be part of something that's uh, happening that is redirecting how education looks at serving children, uh, youth, and families. Uh, it's a very exciting moment. We've got a history in Nova Scotia of integrated service delivery model. The train has left the station, and we're glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'm just uh, privileged to be part of this team. My name's Stan Kucher, and we are all here for the same purpose. Our group is actually not here to be tram. Our group is here to try to work together with every committed, passionate, thoughtful person in this country to improve the lives of kids and their families. That's our goal. It includes us, it includes you, and includes hundreds of thousands of people who aren't in this room. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details. We can talk about a lot of the details at the posters, which I think is appropriate. But what we are going to be trying to do is to create horizontal linkages in vertical worlds. We're going to be working at making effective, systematic, sustained change that occurs from the bottom up and from the top down. We need both, with families and youth and communities at the center of what we do. We are going to build on things which are already successful in this country and elsewhere. We are unabashedly going to bring into play through our best-in-class innovations those things that we already have good evidence that they work but aren't being applied. And there's a lot of that stuff across this country. We're going to bring them together and we're going to link schools and communities, primary care and special care services. And not just schools in terms of high school, junior high, but across the spectrum into post-secondary. Colleges and universities, colleges, technical schools, etc., because that's where the kids are. Our task also is to build on some of the new directions that we're having in Canada, the directions found in the Evergreen document, which is the National Child and Youth Mental Health Strategy, and the Direction in Changing Lives, which is the Mental Health Commission of Canada Mental Health Strategy. There's a lot of tremendous innovation there. We want to build on the stuff that we're already doing. And it's very important for us, as Ian said, to have very solid global linkages. In our team, we have a number of very well, re, very well resourced, very thoughtful, very helpful international groups like the World Health Organization. The purpose of that is to take that expertise that other people have and blend it into what we're doing now. And the other purpose of that is to take the knowledge that we create, because we're going to research all of these things, take the knowledge that we create and make it available not only to improve the lives of Canadians, but hopefully in a way to improve mental health globally as well. So we thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to be part of this wonderful and exciting process. Thank you very much, Stan and Catherine, Kelly, Don, and Ian. Thank you. Um, now we have the integrated wellness platform for youth mental health, the Pan-Canadian IWP network with Bill Morrison. Good, good afternoon. Great to be here and uh, I'm used to doing 45, an hour and a half classes, so I'm gonna really st stretch it into something shorter. So it's a real pleasure to be here to talk to you about the Integrated Wellness Platform uh, uh, Network, Pan-Canadian Network. And uh, I'm gonna work through the questions as, as outlined. Um, so who is our team? Who's part of our team? Well, the first thing, we have the Canadian Health and Education Research Network, or CHURN, uh, which is made up of uh, researchers from across the country, Eastern, Central, and Western Canada. 
uh, five major centers, research centers on school health, uh, as well as the Evaluation Society of, of Canada. So we're really pleased to have um, uh, a group of researchers that have been working in uh, population health, uh, in youth health, but also at local levels, making, uh, making data available to schools and communities at the local level. Second one is the Pan-Canadian Joint Consortium for School Health. Uh, we've, we've worked actually with the uh, Pan-Canadian Joint Consortium for School Health for the past uh, five or six years uh, as, a, as a research team. Uh, the Pan-Canadian Joint, Joint Consortium for School Health represents all provincial and territorial ministries of health and education. Uh, at a senior, uh, at a senior uh, bureaucratic level, so we've had a chance to work uh, with, with governments. Our main focus over the last number of years has been positive mental health environments and really looking at how do you bolster treatment approaches, uh, how do you take service delivery approaches but bolster them by having environments that really support not uh, youth with mental health related conditions but also across the board promoting resiliency factors in youth. Uh, another member is the Canadian Training Institute. Uh, which has offices in Central and Western Canada, a uh, nonprofit organization uh, that uh, provides training uh, to service providers, uh, beginning first in the correctional and policing fields, but then extending on to community-based service providers in uh, mental health, trauma, and problem substance use. I'm getting through all these partnerships here. Family Services Canada Network is a uh, network of over 200 agencies, nonprofit, uh, that serve families uh, in the community nonprofit uh, through counseling, advocacy, parenting programs, and uh, they've adopted the Integrated Wellness Platform as, as part of their uh, uh, service delivery, especially on the EAP front. And um, we're really happy to have there because they represent a grassroots community. Uh, on, on their boards, they have family members, parents, uh, and uh, youth that serve in terms of uh, shaping programs uh, around mental health. Uh, finally, we have the Center for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry from Holland. We've been working with this international group for the past uh, uh, five years. Uh, their area of expertise has been uh, use of community outreach teams or ACT teams, and what they call them FACT teams, Flexible Assertive Community Treatment Teams, that bring together service providers to be able to provide uh, support to young people, not in offices, but in outbound community uh, efforts. So we're really pleased to have uh, uh, Pan-Canadian, where we reach from coast to coast, uh, involving government, community, as well as the research network. So what is the problem we, we propose to solve? Boy, this is big for 10 minutes. The first thing is shifting paradigms. We know that there are risk and need associated, and levels of risk need associated with those with mental health conditions. On our team, in fact, we, we just sat and talked about this. Four of us uh, as team members here have children uh, with long-standing mental health conditions. And I'll tell you, this touches me at, uh, uh, at a heart level because I've, I have traveled with my daughter for the past five years through, uh, through navigating our system. One of the biggest things we'll need to do, first of all, is have a commitment to a unified treatment philosophy that builds not only on reducing risk, but also builds strength, resiliency in our youth, in our communities and schools. Um, you'll notice that we've talked about an application of a tri-continuum care um, model, which has at its base positive mental health environments, um, schools, communities. When we provide services and treatment to youth, um, they go back into communities of support. And sometimes they're not communities of support. Um, when we have a strength at a base where we have positive mental health practices and perspectives, we actually are adding to the, uh, the potential to booster our treatment approaches for, for children and youth. Um, we've done a fair amount of work in looking at what creates those kind of environments, what are the benchmarks, how do you measure that, but more importantly, how do you embed practices uh, that make a difference for children and youth and families within our communities. Second one is making sure at a secondary level, um, to be honest with you, as I've looked across systems across this country and internationally, uh, secondary level of support or intervention where we have screening and immediate support, right service at the right time for youth, we've had gaps there. Sometimes when we're ready to refer, we refer out to a tertiary level and we haven't had a chance to respond at an earlier point. So a major thrust of our proposal is also uh, at our school and community levels, early screening, provision of treatment supports within an environment that is supported through positive mental health. Finally, uh, looking at tertiary level support is, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take, get rid of all of our silos, have an integrated system that takes the best practice in terms of teaming with one point of entry, one file, full engagement of youth and families with supportive environments, 
and bolster our treatment efforts at a tertiary level. In other words, when we talk about providing secondary tertiary level, being able to, within our teams, be able to uh, provide increased intensity of services, but also step down without referring to another program, another service, waiting lists, and wait times. This is the experience of, of my family, of my daughter, as she's gone through waiting times and wait services, coming together to provide an integrated point. So how do we do this? Um, well, how do we get youth services they need at an earlier point? Single point of intake. It means integration of services. It means all departments, communities, acknowledging and supporting a single point of entry. Common information management systems. So how will, how will our idea help more youth access care? Well, we've talked about leaving our offices, going to where youth are, community, schools, even workplaces. Um, you know, in mental health, our, our attrition rates are 30 to 50% across this country. People don't come to offices. They may make the appointment, they may not. The research would show us that when we start moving into settings, and some of the research we've been involved with, we've seen uh, actually double the treatment capacity in terms of access and providing support when services are provided on site, close to people, close to where they are. When you have teams that actually can together reach school, communities, uh, wrapping around youth at the right intensity at the right time, we see impact in the lives of children and youth. And again, within an environment that's gonna support those kind of treatment strategies. So we look at collaboration with school-based student services teams and community service providers to provide earlier and environmental supports. And also, when we transition from different services, ensuring that there's continuity of services so that we don't drop off. Navigating that system is a, an amazing challenge. How will we get youth uh, better care? Delivery school and community-based interprofessional professional fact teams. That stands for flexible, assertive community treatment teams. You can look it up on the web. You'll see our partners from overseas that have been working with us for the past five years on approaches for multidisciplinary teams, different ways of doing business together, integrated, but in such a way that we, we can increase intensity and, and step down. And finally, reconceptualizing system-centric care to, uh, to youth through a family system-centered approach. Biggest challenges. I think we need a paradigm shift. We need to see things differently. We talked this morning about collaboration, meaningful collaboration, engagement of youth, family-centered approaches. Also, the power of positive mental health environments. You know, um, some of the biggest changes, even in our own family's life and in my daughter's life, was when the school and the community actually came alongside and we worked together collaboratively, when practices were restorative, when practices meant that we were supporting the social and emotional development of all children and youth. And finally, integrative team practices that have the capacity to increase and decrease intensity based on youth needs without continual referral or shifting of relationships within the uh, service delivery system. From there, we, uh, we've talked about once we have that shift, in, uh, that shift in terms of paradigm and mode of practice, the importance will be the ability to scale that up so that we have national examples. Uh, we've looked across the country and we've talked about having a, a minimum of at least three uh, different sites where we could look at uh, uh, an integrative approach to um, uh, child and youth treatment on a, beginning with positive mental health environments, a strength and secondary intervention, and a tertiary level model where we can step up and step down treatment at, uh, intensity without referral to, to other services. We have the capacity. We've done a single site, uh, actually in the New Brunswick context, where we've actually seen some wonderful treatment gains, where we've seen uh, waiting lists that have stopped, uh, where we've seen uh, increased health even among people providing services together because we've decided to change our paradigm about how to do service. I've had 25 years as a psychologist, clinical psychologist in both school and community mental health fronts. So I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, my heart is here as a parent, as a clinician, as a researcher. So. To all of you, wish you the best and hope we can make the best linkages, however it unfolds here, uh, to make a difference in the lives of, of youth and families. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, we've got a, a slight change in the order. Uh, next, I'm going to be asking Anne Duffy to come up, uh, just in case um, uh, it's not Patricia at the moment, it's going to be Anne next. And after this talk, what I'll do is I'll just pause and you'll have a chance to reflect on your tables in terms of what you've heard so far, what interests you, uh, where you think the possible connections are and so forth. 
Uh, those don't know, Anne uh, was involved in the Calgary floods, and I personally think it is amazing that she is here today. Uh, she has had huge personal issues to deal with, so Anne, uh, I think it's amazing you're here. I'm really impressed. Thank you, Peter. Now you're going to make you me cry. Um, and all of you who know me well know that I cry very easily. Um, but um, I'm here today, actually, thank you, Peter, that's very kind. I'm here today actually representing a network, a nascent network of individuals who are committed uh, to preventing an early, to prevention and early intervention of depression in adolescence and suicide. And I'll go through who those uh, institutions, individuals, and families um, are as we go through the presentation. But thank you very much for inviting me. And I should say that for people who don't know me, I'm an adolescent psychiatrist who actually has spent um, <clears throat> my career researching the early natural history of psychiatric disorders in youth. So what is our focus? Well, <clears throat> our focus on, is on those with the greatest need and for whom there is effective treatment. So if we really want to make a difference for youth mental health outcomes, for youth at, serious, at risk for serious and continuing psychiatric disorders, then we need, I'm afraid, to focus. We, we, I think it's going to be a fine line between going too broad and actually diluting and not being able to make a difference to going too narrow. And um, so when um, I was thinking about all of the fantastic opportunities that were developing around this uh, initiative, I really started to notice that um, what was happening was that there was a huge population um, at risk and at need um, for whom we actually have evidence of effective treatments and we could make a huge difference. And those are depressed adolescents. And um, so depression and suicide represent life-threatening illnesses that are really gateway illnesses into a number of different trajectories. Not only my research, but many other people's research in this room has shown this, that depression can be the beginning of recurrent major depression and suicide, substance abuse, psychosis, and bipolar disorder. So this is really a critical opportunity. And um, this represents a major uh, loss to not only the individuals and their families who I work with, but to society. And we need to really uh, enumerate that loss. Um, currently, we do not identify or engage seriously depressed and suicidal youth from the broader heterogeneous group of distressed adolescents. And um, I put one size does not fit all because I've been fighting this for years as a clinical researcher, it, whether it be in Ottawa, uh, at CHEO, whether it be in Halifax at the IWK, whether it now in Calgary, at the Children's Hospital, our care pathways do not identify young people at serious risk of continuing and recurrent psychiatric disorders from adolescents who are uh, manifesting a number of emotional problems which frankly will either get better on their own or better with non-specific support. So like in other areas of medicine, we need to really identify the group that have the most need and that we can do the most for. Um, why do I say this? Sorry, I'm just going to move this over here. Well. Depressive disorders represent the major burden of illness and premature death in adolescents uh, up to age 24, followed by road accident, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, all of which are related to depressive disorder, including then the next rank group, um, substance abuse and self-inflicted injuries. So major depression is a target population that will actually have a major impact on all of these, uh, the premature mortality and morbidity in this age group. Um, suicide uh, is the second leading cause of death for adolescents in Canada. Wow. Like, wow. That is shocking. And we as a country need to focus on this. You know, there's various pockets of excellence, and we've actually linked as a network with McGill Group for Suicide Studies and the Quebec Group, um, Joanne Renault's group, and Monique Sega, Sega, et cetera, who have focused their careers on understanding suicide, and we, sh we could really benefit from that information, and we're linking with that group already. So not only is it the second leading cause of death in Canadian youth, but it is almost exclusively the purvey of depression. 90% of young people who commit suicide were depressed at the time, either on a trajectory to other disorders or clinically depressed at the time. And there's many, many more suicide attempts per completed suicide. So this is a national crisis. 
Um, the, most mo the highest modifiable risk factor for these outcomes, depression and suicide, is substance abuse. So substance abuse goes hand in hand as a major comorbidity that's modifiable and treatable and uh, in this age group and in this population. Really important. Why is it important to intervene early? Well, I don't think I have to convince this audience, but certainly this is a, a model based on a collaborative uh, international and national work showing that, yes, we have a combination of genetically sensitive pathways that lead us into uh, maybe um, some minor subtle abnormalities that we can pick up. But then as illness onsets and progresses, those subtle neurobiological, behavioral, emotional abnormalities actually become less plastic. And so our chances of effective intervening are far reduced. So we actually have a critical window of opportunity in adolescence when the majority of these illnesses onset to make a huge difference to the life trajectory of individuals who are going to be our productive members of society and, and um, we, we can't afford to, to wait. Now depression, as I said, is a gateway illness. Um, a number of us who research our early trajectories of psychiatric disorders would agree that depression is a, is, a, is a major common pathway to a number of different important outcomes. And it's very hard to differentiate kids on the trajectory to psychosis versus kids on the trajectory to bipolar dis dis disorder versus recurrent melancholic um, depression just on the basis of symptoms. Um, also, it's very easy to capture false positives where it's, it's very common for kids to endorse hypomanic symptoms or depressive symptoms that are transient. So we really have to be careful that we don't uh, pathologize normal adolescence either in our best efforts. What are we proposing? We want to implement and evaluate the effectiveness and cost savings of school-based screening and early intervention programs that are evidence-based and are currently running in primary and secondary care. We want to implement and evaluate the effectiveness and cost savings of, of a directly linked youth-friendly, so the young speaker uh, earlier this morning is an example of youth-friendly, social media savvy, capturing, engaging the, the target population, rapid uh, direct assessment um, with multidisciplinary teams and specialty care based on the evidence. Okay, I can't tell you the number of kids in my studies and the, the agony the families go through because those kids, even in, in our society where they have a tertiary care children's hospital, again, whether it be CHEO, the IWK, or the Alberta Children's Hospital, we do not take care of those kids. We either miss them or we discharge them. And uh, there's no long-term surveillance program. So here's the content. So we have um, basically identifying, screening and identifying kids in the schools with serious depressive and self-harm suicidal symptoms. We have evidence-based eclectic treatments that we would like to adapt to each school environment. And then we would like to also identify kids who are either A, not getting better, or B, getting worse, or C, at risk for continuing problems based, for example, on the risk factors such as a family history. Family history is the most robust risk factor, and we do not take family histories in psychiatry. I can't believe it. Wow. So family history of suicide, psychosis, or recurrent major depression, bipolar disorder. Those are kids that merit surveillance just like breast cancer. I'm in a breast cancer high-risk screening program because of my family history, and I'm very grateful for that. In those kids that require specialized treatment, we would have the ability then to test um, current treatments that are effective in seriously depressed adolescents in the adult population, and also uh, test novel uh, in, 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 in in, what am I saying, interventions as well, and really feedback. So it's a back and forth bi-directional translation of information to continue to improve care pathways. Um, and I'm just gonna finish here. So who are we? We're a multidisciplinary nascent network of health professionals, um, public institutions, government, community stakeholders, and patient advocates. Far before it was fashionable, I had the pleasure of being trained by Paul Groff, who set up a patient advisory, parent and young people, like 15 years ago. So he was well ahead of the curve, and we've always worked with our families, and we have one member with us 
uh, here at this meeting today. Um, we're currently centered in Quebec, Ontario, and Alberta, but plans to expand nationally. We, everyone who knows us, we're an extremely collaborative group, passionate, and we recognize that we're possibly weak on the network side, but we're strong on the content side and passion. And so we're looking at this meeting to see if we can actually integrate without losing the content um, into another network. So there you go. Um, and uh, finally, I just wanted to quote Patrick, who I quote often actually, and wonderful mentor from, a, from afar. I should also say we have an international advisory group too, too with Jan Scott on board, who's amazing. And um, you know, it's a no-brainer. It's a best buy. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. thank you, Anne, and thanks so much to all four of those initial networks for presenting and sticking within the 10 minutes so brilliantly. Yeah, that was fantastic. Okay. Thank you, everyone. To go. Thank you, Ross. You're, you're doing a great job. And thank you to CIHR and the Beck Foundation for hosting this event and this very important initiative. I'm going to talk to you about the SEALS Network. Um, this is a group of uh, researchers, uh, care providers, and, and other um, uh, advocacy groups who have come together with the idea that um, in order to make transformational changes, um, there has to be a very strong evaluation component. I come and many of my colleagues come from the addiction and the behavioral disorders field where there are a number of demonstrations of intervention programs not just not having an effect but actually having harm in young people. And so what we're very committed to is making changes but evaluating those changes as they're implemented in new, in, in new contexts, but also as they're brought to scale across Canada. Our, our, um, our um, <coughs> network is comprised uh, first and foremost of communities that have shown preparedness for high quality longitudinal intervention or service evaluation research with youth in their community. Um, so this involves schools, primary care, other service providers, child and adolescent um, and adult secondary services, um, as well as local um, parent and um, ad relevant advocacy groups. They also have to have demonstrated capacity for collaboration and research output. Our partners also include um, individuals, corporations, organizations with specialized deliverables. So these are people um, and organizations that can provide us with evidence-based interventions, uh, the IP and manuals and materials for evidence-based interventions, or the assessment and service delivery, delivery platforms. I'll tell you a little bit more about those. These are also teams with highly specialized methodological value, um, which includes ethics input, patient perspective input, uh, clinical trials input, as well as um, biomarkers and um, various um, other uh, methodological approaches. And, and finally, these are teams with disordered specific expertise, so spanning child and adolescent services, but also spanning <coughs> early intervention, primary, secondary, and tertiary care. I'll tell you a little bit more about our network a little bit later, but first I want to tell you about um, what we look like and what we plan or hope to do in collaboration with many other partners here in this room. So at the moment, we've got a group in Nova Scotia, in Montreal, Ottawa, and Northern Ontario, and a group in Interior BC who um, we have identified as being prepared to do the kind of work we'd like to, to talk to you about today. And um, it's also worth mentioning that in the two weeks since we've had feedback from, from TRAM, we've had two other communities, actually three other communities, agree to come on board. And in the span of just an hour this morning, we've had two other communities approach us and looking like they're prepared and willing to work with us on this initiative. Um, what is the problem? Well, um, and what's unique about our solution? 
Um, some of our ideas are drawn from a very large mapping study that was done by the National Institute of Health Research in the UK, designed to address this very issue of improving mental health access, mental, mental health service access. Um, and their conclusions were, um, I think I have a diagram that better describes what the conclusions were, but that we needed better integrated services that uh, are integrated with health and public services that have superior outreach. They allow for more systematic screening of the general population and that we must facilitate more rapid delivery of low intensity services. This was a study that was authored by the AMP um, network in the UK. But as you see here, the idea is that primary care, community engagement, and a system that can deliver evidence-based psychological interventions have to work together. Um, and you see the arrows, I think, show this very dynamic working together of the various systems. And what I like about this is that it also shows that community engagement is the largest wheel. Um, and unfortunately, in Canada, is, is an untapped area. Um, there's also a couple of other basic facts. There's a strong evidence base for school-based interventions that can prevent the onset of substance misuse as well as uh, mental disorders. Those do not exist at a large scale in Canada by any means. But we already have data to, to show that if you do implement them um, and you um, evaluate them, they can be effective and they can reduce mental health, significant mental health problems and addiction by 50%. Similarly, there's a strong or growing evidence that brief indicated interventions targeting early signs of onset of the problem can also reduce significant mental health problems by 50%. There's a strong evidence base for current practices in mental health at the second, primary, secondary, and tertiary level. But these programs, I'm using terms by Rudolf Uhr, when we first started to talk about and form this network, these are not proactive and they're often haphazard. You might have one child in one part of Canada who is identified early with early signs of severe mental illness. And within 24 hours, the local service um, is structured so that that child and his family are, are seen and serviced, whereas that same child in another part of Canada might have to wait until their severe mental illness, let's say psychosis, escalates to comorbid psychosis and cannabis misuse, and that person is seen much further on down the road. So there's a lack of standardization of service delivery across the country, and these are three areas that our network hope to um, address and we believe and we've already been told that this is ambitious we believe that if you can tackle these three things um, for which there is already evidence base you can reduce the burden of mental health by 50 to 70 percent in the general population how do we propose to do this well there's a need for more strategies involving screening and I think there's a lot of consensus in the room today that screening has to be implemented Targeted prevention, I'll talk about that in a second, early intervention for those showing early signs of the problem, and then systematic referral to specialized uh, primary care and specialized services. And the way this could be done is beginning at school age with school age children, um, assessing for first onset of symptom and risk, and risk could be family history, in our case it could be personality risk or other types of risk factors. Um, providing targeted prevention. A few years down the road, um, you then screen again and identify those who aren't able to uh, um, benefit from low intensity preventative interventions. So now you're working with a smaller portion of the population who might need, who are showing persistent mental health symptoms and now are it, it is showing perhaps some impact of their symptoms on their functioning, who require slightly more in, uh, intensive services. Um, and then down the road, potentially those who can't benefit from those interventions are the ones who then need to be referred to um, more intensive and specialized services. And so what we call this is our, our, a stepped care model. We're not the first to propose a stepped care model. Uh, many other people in the field, um, in the UK, inc including the WHO, have, have suggested that the way to improve access to mental health has to be through a step care model for a number of reasons. First, the step care models allow for systematic screening and follow-up. So you can track the people who are showing persistent problems and need. 
Second, it reduces stigma around mental health services by gradually exposing the general population to different gradations of services. It gradually improves mental health awareness and access, but it also allows your specialized services to develop more proactive um, and rapid strategies for that smaller portion of the population requiring more intensive care, and it reduces the bottlenecks um, for the high intensity services. So you've addressed potentially 50% of the problem in the community, reserving those more high intensity interventions for those who would need it. How will our idea help youth get better? Well, the structure of the STEELS network is designed to promote dissemination of evidence-based protocols, uh, guidelines in six areas, targeting mood disorders, anxiety, psychosis, behavioral problems, substance misuse, and eating disorders. We use web-facilitated um, delivery of services as well as assessment um, across different levels of care. And um, every community that would work with us would have access to an assessment platform and a service delivery platform as well as treatment manuals and protocols. The structure of the um, consortium would look something like this. So we have um, on the horizontal axis, we would have um, the more functional groups, site coordination. <coughs> At the moment, it's about five sites, but it's looking like that's um, already moved up to seven to ten sites. Um, groups who will specialize in the implementation of an assessment platform, indicated prevention, brief interventions, liaison to primary care and knowledge transfer to primary care, service evaluation at that point, and some health economic analysis. But importantly, we also have the um, vertical input from theme specialists, and these are teams, not just individuals, ethicists, the patient perspective, um, as well as methodologists, and a group who would begin to start to study the biologic mechanisms of treatment non-response. So those who have been through evidence-based interventions and who are unable to benefit from low-intensity services, these are the people we should be studying from a biologic perspective. Um, and so we've incorporated that into our protocol. Um, I'm not going to go through um, all of our partners, but what you see here is that in red are our, our team leads or our site leads, and just a, a couple of the different organizations that they bring with them to demonstrate that every team would have a lead but would also have representation of primary care, secondary care, um, uh, patient groups, and researchers with specialized within that area or theme. How would we do this? Um, this is just an example of a step wedge randomized design. The, the advantage of this type of approach is that you never have to force anyone to a non-treatment control group. You use different cohorts and compare cohorts who access your model at different s stages in their development as a way to compare um, how the interventions um, can work, and so this is an example of a step wedge design. We've had input to this network from um, a, a, a trialist who specializes in HIV prevention trials. Um, he conducts uh, trials across tw uh, 25 sites in Africa at the moment, HIV prevention trials. And so it's giving us a lot of input on how could we do a, a, a large effectiveness focused trial of a step care model. And one advantage here is that within five years we could study a nine year treatment period in youth ages 12 to 24, while also providing that whole community with evidence-based interventions. What are the biggest challenges we still need to address? So what we're proposing, a large integrated project that will follow over 10,000 youth ages 12 to 24, longitudinally over five years. We're testing a step care model. And it's important to mention that embedded within this large trial will be sub-projects focusing on special populations. So we have a group focusing on special populations, Aboriginal youth, special populations such as homeless youth. Um, but um, we would also have sub-projects that would focus on mediators, active ingredients, comparative effects, 
and treatment um, mechanisms of treatment non-response. The challenges, I feel the biggest challenge is developing a sustainable integrated database and platform for longitudinal data collection that can integrate information from various services and that the Canadian public will trust and use. Um, so at the moment we've made a lot of headway through all the great work that is being conducted by the, the researchers and the service providers in, in our network. We have a number of excellent research um, and data management platforms and service delivery platforms already identified and available to us. Um, the, the trick will be to how do you make these work together and then how do you bring it forward to, um, to become a sustainable pr uh, platform. Um, I guess the second challenge identified is that each identified community has mechanisms in place to conduct such a trial. Our challenge will be to prepare other communities and bring on board other communities to, gen to, to demonstrate generalizability. Um, and the mechanisms we've put in place for that is a mentorship program, so our current communities will partner with other communities identified as being almost ready and they will um, work with that community to help them bring themselves to a point of being perfectly prepared to, um, to participate in some of this work. Just to see, we're at 10 minutes. Okay. Patricia, is that all right? All right. So I'll, I'll just stop right here, just giving you a bit of an idea of how it is that we've in, involved the youth perspective in the work that we do. Um, our, all of our interventions are developed with youth input to the point where our young people vote on the artists who um, develop our manuals. Um, uh, they, the, they, their perspective is incorporated in the content of the intervention, so their own scenarios are reflected back in interventions. And the model that we're using to um, translate our evidence-based interventions to new contexts is now being used across the world in Australia, in the Netherlands. It's a process by which you do a cultural adaptation of an evidence-based intervention. And that obviously would be an important part of uh, our network as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you. And I now uh, welcome Ashok Mala to come up and talk about the um, transforming mental health services to improve outcomes for youth. Thanks, Ross. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you know, uh, we've been at this for a long time, and over a year ago, we had the workshop in Toronto where the, the building blocks for this uh, TRAM initiative were really put in place, and several people who were here were there at the time. Uh, then we got home, and basically, it was actually not that difficult for us to put a group together that included all the stakeholders that, uh, quite rightly, <laughs> the TRAM initiative has given some guidance about. Um, we're also simple-minded, so we kind of uh, kept our, what we want to do is very much what was the spirit of the TRAM. And the spirit of the TRAM is transformation in a particular age group of the way mental health services are delivered and to produce better outcomes. So I think what uh, the other simplicity and parsimony that uh, we decided to do was to do the presentation exactly according to what we were told to do. I'm youngest of eight, I'm very obedient, so I tend to do exactly what I'm told. Uh, so what we've done is we've basically gone for the depth and we are building the breadth here. The depth is that we are actually not interested in tinkering with the system, but actually changing the way mental health care is delivered to this age group uh, in our current system. So we decided to do a uh, somewhat similar to the kind of design that Patricia talked about uh, in, in terms of controlled trial. I'm not going to go into the methodological details. However, in order to get the partners together, we have an excellent uh, kind of an environment and, uh, in, in Quebec, which is catchment areas, where both health and social services are provided together. So we have Basically, we're taking two catchment areas, two Cetroises, one a downtown, one in a suburban area, and then we've gone to Ontario and recruited an area uh, where, which is basically primarily rural, semi-urban, with two Aboriginal communities, and 
they have a very unique system where the hospital and the community mental health services are under one organization. So this is an opportunity to, to work in an environment. So we're going to basically, um, in addition to that, as you can see, I'm not going to go through every, we are a, we're a bunch of clinicians, researchers, uh, involving family and youth was really nothing new for us because you know, our early psychosis work, we've done that over years. And what we're now doing is what we have actually done in early psychosis. And in fact, I have learned through uh, my own clinical uh, studies that doing diagnosis uh, focused, first, first of all, it's not very economical because at the front end, people are not going to learn how to separate psychosis from depression, from anxiety. So it makes sense that we, on one hand, take what we have learned in the early psychosis field, apply it to the entire youth mental health, but at the same time bring in uh, this whole idea of phase-specific interventions. So what is unique about, uh, first of all, we're going to do, we, we want to actually demonstrate that something we do transformational is actually going to work, and then we spread it across over an implementation period and even in the demonstration period, what we are looking for is environments that are different because this kind of design allows you to roll over your randomized or your control trial into different environments as you learn. Uh, we are, what are we going to actually do? We're, we're suggesting as, uh, essentially what we have done in the past in one field to spread it across, which is an open referral system, rapid response, quick assessment, and this time aided by, because time has changed, we, are, we have uh, in our group expertise of using e-mental health that will be one of many gates of entry. And I think one of the things in the system, the transform system, that has to be put in place is flexibility. There have to be several doors. Those of you who have ever been to a mosque, there are many ways of entering a mosque, and the light comes with, the, with those doors. And I think there have to be many, many doors of entering the system. Some young people may not feel ready that they're going to go and talk to somebody. So an A portal might be the way that they go and make contact and ask questions, and then they're ready to actually talk to somebody. It's going to be seamless. We are not interested in transition. We are not going to work, how do we transit from child, adolescent, to adult. We, we want to create a system where it is 11 to 25, so the transitions are going to be after 25, before 11. And the good thing about it is that 75% of mental disorders arise in that age group. And hopefully, with a better system and better, better interventions, you're not going to need to transit as many people after 25 as we do currently. And as I said, we are going to leverage e-technologies to the maximum possible. Uh, what is the problem? We, uh, how will we, uh, our idea help identify youth? Um, just to highlight a couple of things, as I said, multiple ways of entry, but at the same time, it, it leads to the same door in, at the end, that they have, there has to be a very quick response. I combine, we decided to combine this more and better together, because partly because the slide was too long. I couldn't, uh, we couldn't read it. Uh, an old professor of mine many years ago gave me one advice, said, never present a slide that takes more than 11 seconds to read. And I think that's a very good advice. So if I had put the original slide, it would have taken you longer. So uh, how are we going to do this more and provide better care? By, as I said, by totally transforming the current delivery of youth mental health care across both primary and specialized care, but really giving the primary care as the, the primacy over, over arranging. And that then connecting with, as you heard before, I think we have to include the educational system. All the early case detection studies I have done have really been uh, based both in primary health care as well as in the education sector because that's where the young people are. And the other thing I want to highlight is uh, that we will, as I said, and this is what we believe, that we have to, whatever we do, we have to actually show that it works. So the a traditional randomized control trial is not going to work, but there are new ways of, of doing control studies, and that is the methodology we're going to use and, and at the same time uh, test out its implementation, implementation within the five years. The, what are the uh, biggest challenges? 
even though at the, right at the beginning we re recognize what we're actually, all of us work in a network, except that that network doesn't work very well. So what we, are, what we have done is put together a network of networks. They are small networks, but what we, have, what we need to do is our challenge is to connect with other networks, other teams, uh, beyond the, the, the two provinces that we're currently, and we've already been speaking to several other people, there are also certain patient, uh, certain populations, youth populations, that we need better access to. For example, youth through the justice system. So we're connecting with people who work with homeless and who work through the justice system. We have, up until now, just the nature of our environment is such that we don't have much experience with uh, indigenous mental health, and that has to be included in, in, in this as well because the imp implementation there may be different, but we'll still need to do a control trial involve that, them also in the control trial. Uh, we, we have to get a much better, somebody asked me, we, we had a preliminary meeting a few days ago, so but what exactly is your proposal? What are you going to do? So we don't know because we have to work on that proposal with all of the partners. We're not there yet. The proposal would be work with trying to, through understanding each and every component of our networks, and that includes family, youth. Uh, we, have, we have policy in, uh, people involved. We have the National Director of Mental Health in Quebec involved, but we also have to involve other policy people. And we are going to build this proposal uh, when I say proposal, I don't mean a written proposal, the proposal to actually transform uh, mental health services for youth through constructing our own theory of change, which is we, we look at our assumptions, we examine our assumptions, we test them out with all the stakeholders and from the evidence, and then we, ch we change the way we're, we're, we're uh, dealing with those assumptions. And that's how we're going to build this, this proposal. Uh, I, I think this is, a, this is something I've learned in the last year or so, how much it, it can help if you build your own, it shouldn't really be called theory of change, it should be called a model of change. And we are going to uh, work beyond just, we were talking about collaboration, I think collaboration is mo more than that, we need integration and we're going to have to, this is a challenge, it's a huge challenge to actually integrate systems of care that have functioned as far as they're concerned well enough, the providers are mostly happy with what they do, it's the receivers who are not happy with it. And I think that's what we have to, to change. And uh, one of our colleagues, uh, one of our uh, colleagues who's here, uh, Marianne Leverser, said that we have, while we're thinking outside the box, we also have to think inside the box, because that's where the realities are. So we, whatever we do, it has to be a, a combination of the realities uh, changing, changing the way we, we operate within those realities, but at the same time constantly look outside and, and bring in. And I think the last thing I want to say is that in our building network, we have uh, s many, many people who have both lived experience, people who have experience as providers, and the same people also have experience as very innovative community-oriented research. So I think we are a kind of a network that would be very happy to, to make uh, associations and alliance with several other teams. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. And our last uh, network presentation comes from Transformational Research in Adolescent Mental Health uh, Network for Adolescents and Youth with Psychosis, and that's Donald Adlington, or sorry, Addington. So, Donald, welcome. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm introducing uh, this network and speaking on behalf of them today. We've uh, met up as individuals, the team who are here for the first time, uh, and we comprise a, a, a parent, uh, a consumer, a leader in a national organization, a community organization, and myself as a researcher. So um, one of the issues facing us as a group and uh, the eventual s selection is, is the uh, endless issue of, of lumpers and splitters and where we are um, along this continuum. So our proposal uh, it 
as it's currently worded is for adolescent and youth in psychosis. That's not actually what we set out to uh, propose, um, but it's what we could build uh, in a fairly short time and is something that fell together quite easily and naturally. The, uh, rather like uh, Ashok, well Ashok and I have been in the same business uh, for about the same amount of time. Um, and we've been involved in early psychosis uh, intervention research and service delivery. And so within that uh, group, we identified, uh, we've had some successes and some failures. And you, you will be hearing uh, today, I think it is about the the stroke network, and I work in a general health system, although I'm, uh, I'm a psychiatrist and uh, a, a mental health researcher, so um, I'm very aware of other groups, uh, and in particular in, in Calgary, the success of the local stroke uh, network that has evolved and is part of a national stroke network that has been hugely successful at a Canadian level. And so I'm aware of how much better we could have been doing with early psychosis intervention if we'd had a network a decade ago. So wh what we set out to, to do in this proposal is develop a network that is actually a network proposal as, uh, rather than a, a project proposal, and in due course we've had our feedback to say, well, what are you actually going to do? Uh, as part of the feedback from the, the selection committee. So we do have some uh, more specific ideas, uh, but I'll lump them together quickly. So um, the psychosis group is a group that's focused on uh, being a national network and is focused on some uh, key principles uh, that are common to some uh, of the proposals, early identification, evidence-based care, uh, understanding effectively uh, pathways to care. So the, uh, the groups who are part of our team have, we've tried to get at a national level, patients, families, researchers, uh, community organizations, knowledge and synthesis, knowledge synthesis and translation units, uh, policy advisors, healthcare providers, educators, and clinical leaders. Uh, if I look back at more than a 10 to 20 years of early psychosis intervention, we've never had a broad group at a national level that have uh, focused on supporting and implementing these uh, kind of programs. So we have evidence-based effective programs, but I, you know, as mentioned, it's patchy. Uh, what you get in one place isn't what you get in another place. There are no standards. Uh, there are no fidelity scales, um, and there is no national uh, data collection, reporting, or accountability on these programs and services. So, um, so as w um, we have, so what is unique and transformational about our solution? So we've got the right network members to to develop and deliver at this continuum of knowledge, and that in that way for the early psychosis a group, this is a transformation for this group. I think it needs to go beyond that. But that, uh, if you look at why this hasn't done better, this is the sort of transformational change uh, that could bring it about. Um, so we have sound principles from planning to implementing quality evidence-based practices and multi-domain outcome measurements. So we have focused in these years on developing performance measures, evidence-based clinical practice guidelines, uh, pathways to care, and, um, 
and fidelity scales by which you can actually measure how well the programs adhere to those evidence-based practices. So um, how will our ideas help to identify youth who need service treatment who are currently neither identified nor treated? Uh, in one way, if you just, I'm not proposing we stick with psychosis. If you stick with psychosis, the problem is that they declare themselves. Uh, they will hit the hospital if you do nothing. Uh, there will be a big problem. Uh, and the idea is not to, is to identify them earlier. These principles can be broadly applied, uh, as Anne was explaining, to affective disorders. So how have we done this through a combination of increased public education, gatekeeper education, stigma reduction strategies, linked to easy access to youth-friendly services. This, these things are all built on a platform of population-based mental health funding for which you need policy uh, support and each uh, and representation within every province in Canada. And so that is what we are working to build that as a province-by-province -province network. Uh, because they're never going to agree very much on exactly how to do it. And uh, please don't think that you can come to a province and tell them you've got a solution that works in Alberta and it's going to be uh, applicable in Quebec or Ontario. <laughs> so um, the transformational concepts, the kind of uh, projects that we're going to implement, a focus on a, a patient and family perspectives, we have that in demonstration models in psychosis, innovations in access which have been shown to be uh, effective, innovations in organizational linkages and patient flow. So this is actually specifying when someone moves from primary into specialist care and transferring back. Uh, that is, we can do that and identify when they go back. Evaluation of innovative programs, uh, we have uh, a complete range of epidemiologists, clinical trial specialists in health services research, uh, psychopharmacologists, and uh, others interested more in, in genetics and uh, other more future-oriented uh, individual identification of risk. Uh, so we have a nascent clinical trials network within this uh, network proposal, research registries which uh, are part of many other uh, national work networks uh, and these can be research registries for clinical trials, for genetics uh, and for outcome evaluations. Um, and a key strategy which I think has not happened except in one or two places uh, is research and provincial strategy implementation. Uh, none of this will happen unless we get provincial health ministries on side and supporting these kind of initiatives. And you just have to know and understand how that works and get these, these people engaged. So that's the combination of research to identify how they are influenced and actually working with them to change. And then we have innovations in quality of safe, safety, uh, common core program performance measures. These kind of were considered non, uh, uh, not exciting. Uh, however, I think they're critical in the long run uh, to the real world of healthcare uh, common core program performance measures, health system performance measures, so that you can compare the performance of different healthcare systems. This is practical and feasible. Uh, practice guidelines, program fidelity measures, which I've touched on, population-based surveillance and utilization. These are the basics of day-to-day -day healthcare delivery uh, that are very poorly done in mental health. Uh, I'm sure we'll see the results of national comparisons uh, that you can make about stroke outcome, about cardiac outcome. Uh, I'm part of a, 
uh, a wait list performance measure, which is one of the few national, uh, national reporting systems. They don't report any mental health outcomes, despite the fact that we've uh, organized and delivered them. They just don't report them. So that's a political and policy issue to begin to get a little bit more professional, a little bit more like the rest of the healthcare system. Just, just to say we're at 10 minutes. Uh, Thank you. So um, we also require research on network innovations, so research on stakeholder engagement, especially with patients and families. Uh, we have them engaged, but how do we effectively do that? There is a program in Calgary where uh, there is some training and education and support through the University of Calgary provided to uh, not in mental health, but in arthritis and in heart and stroke on, um, on to support consumers be collaborate with researchers. So um, we think through these strategies we can improve the number and quality of the services provided to youth with psychosis and we think that through collaborations enhanced with this meeting, we can broaden this to other groups. So, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ron. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you so much to the uh, networks uh, for presenting uh, their ideas, and I hope that's given you a lot of food for thought.